How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure Start reading in verse 17 and down to verse 26. And, it came to, uh, and he came down with them and stood in the plain. And the company of his disciples and a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem and from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, which came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And they that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for there went virtue out of him, and he healed them all. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the like manner did their fathers under the prophets. But woe unto you that are rich, for ye have received your consolation, Woe unto you that are full, for ye shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, for ye shall mourn and weep. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Last week we saw that Christ was teaching in such a way that it was, it was completely contrary to normal human thinking. And that's why in previous passages he has established his authority. He has established his authority over truth. Uh, he has established his authority over all of uh, creation, and uh, he's established his authority over the spiritual realm. Uh, in all three of those areas, he has established his authority, and that's why people came to hear him, to be healed of their diseases, and to have demons cast out of him, them, because he has established his authority. God has confirmed his authority as the Son of God uh, by performing signs and wonders and miracles. Uh, so many have come, they flock to him, and now a multitude is there to hear him, and he opens his mouth, and he speaks truth that is completely uh, contrary uh, to common sense as far as men are concerned. So he opens his mouth and says, blessed are the poor. And you have a multitude there that are thinking, oh, well, you know what, I'm kind of poor, and I don't really receive it as a blessing. And he takes human thinking and he turns it on his head. Uh, having established his authority, now uh, folks can hear him and hear these truths that are so odd and so out of the norm. Uh, having seen his authority, then they then are willing to accept this truth. Uh, right? Uh, in Matthew chapter 7, after he speaks, the Bible says they were all astonished because he spoke with authority. And uh, it's that authority that he has established that allows him to speak these truths. So he says, blessed are the poor, as we saw this week, uh, last week. This week, you could say, blessed are the persecuted. Blessed are the persecuted. Uh, so the title of this message is, blessed are the persecuted, or how to handle persecution. How to handle persecution. Now, whenever we talk about persecution in the West, we have to qualify the word. Because frankly, Christians in our day and age, in this area of the world, uh, the persecution that we face pales in comparison to what others are experiencing in other parts of the world today and what Christians have faced throughout the centuries. Uh, today you have Christians who are being executed in uh, countries around the world. Uh, if you are a Christian in Iran, if you are a Christian in some other Arab nations, uh, Muslim-dominated nations, you can lose your life for your faith. Uh, this happens all around the world, but it does not happen in the West. So, when we use the word persecution, we need to keep it in context. But the reality is, even in the West, Christians can face uh, persecution to a certain degree, uh, whether it be people separating from you or people hating you, or even laws being passed that infringe upon your rights to practice Christianity. That can happen to a certain degree, even in the West. Uh, so keep it in perspective. Uh, we're still going to call it persecution, and we're going to see how these things apply to us as well. Uh, but certainly, don't walk around with a victim complex. Uh, just think about what other Christians are going through around the world. Okay? So how do you handle persecution? It says in verse 22, Blessed are ye when men shall hate you. That's a blessing, isn't it? 
men hate you, when they shall separate you from their company and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the son of man's sake. These don't seem to be the words or the terms of blessing. He says, rejoice in that day, leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. Woe unto you, in verse 26, when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. So you can see how Christ's teachings, Christ's teachings are so opposite of what uh, people would normally think. I mean, don't you want to be accepted? Don't you want to be accepted? Uh, don't you want to be liked? Uh, you know, some people can't handle it if, you know, they could have, uh, you know, 250 friends, but they hear about one person who doesn't like them and they can't handle it. And they bend over backwards and do everything they can to win that person to themselves because they can't handle the fact that one person does not approve of them or doesn't like them. And some people go through life and that's their mentality. They just want to be accepted. There's some people that go through life and you look at them and you're like, you know what, I, as long as I've known this person, I still don't know who they are. Because depending on who they're talking to, they want to be accepted. And because they want to be accepted, they change and they morph into whatever they think others want them to be. There is a drive to be accepted. And uh, you're an adult, okay? Uh, most up here, an adult, and you think you're pretty well adjusted. Uh, but I would suggest that even you and I look into our lives and say, do I have a drive to be accepted? And do I alter my behavior? And do I live in a certain way? And do I respond to people in a certain way simply because I want to be accepted? Uh, I think many uh, have that as a root of their character in many areas. Uh, but the Bible says here, Jesus says, Blessed are ye not when you're accepted, not when you're embraced, but blessed are you when ye men shall hate you. Well, let's, let's look at this. Persecution. Hatred towards you for your faith. Separation from you for your faith. How do you handle this type of stuff? Well, first of all, if you're going to handle persecution, you have to have the right priorities. You have to have the right priorities. And uh, the first priority you've got to have right in your mind, according to our passage, is that Christ must be if you're going to handle the hatred of others, if you're going to handle the reproach and the separation of others, you're going to have to realize that Christ is supreme over all other relationships. Christ must be supreme in your life compared to all other relationships. Otherwise, you're not going to get this and you're going to fall prey to this persecution and you're going to change and you're going to even possibly fall away from the faith for fear of persecution and because you want to be accepted by the world. So we must establish that Christ is supreme over all of our relationships. See, Christ's priority is not unity. Did you know that? Christ's priority is not unity. Christ's priority is truth. Even truth over unity. See, many in the world and many religions would say it is unity no matter what. Even unity at the expense of truth. Whereas Christ says it's truth above all even at the expense of unity. You see, acceptance and harmony is not our number one priority. Now, I'm not one of these guys that gets behind the pulpit and hammers away saying, hey, uh, it's okay if everybody else in the world, uh, all religions, Christians, even other Baptists, it's okay if they hate me uh, because I'm going to stand for the truth. And often you see the things that they're fighting over are not the truth at all, uh, but uh, they just want to make a demon out of everybody. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, but truth is to be priority, even over unity. Matthew 10, 31. Jesus says, Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Then he says in verse 34, Think not. He's saying, Get this right, okay? Don't think wrong about what I'm about to say, okay? You got to get this right. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. What? I thought Jesus was the Prince of Peace. He is the Prince of Peace, isn't he? But he says, I came not. Don't get this wrong. Don't think that I've come to bring peace. Not peace. I came to bring a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Well, that's a tough saying, isn't it? Very surprising coming from Christ in some of our minds. You see, Christ is about peace, and he is about unity. But he's about peace in the context of truth, and he's about unity in the context of truth. So he came and he sets many men, even in their own household, at variance and division because of Confession of Christ as Savior and Lord. But the purpose of salvation 
bring the Holy Spirit inside of us and transform us into the image of Christ so that ultimately at the end we are brought together in unity. And Ephesians 4 uh, speaks of the unity of the faith. We're coming together in the unity of the faith. That's the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is peace and unity, but it will be in the context of love for Christ and the unity of the faith. So the context is truth there. Truth is the priority and righteousness is the priority and unity and peace will come. But frankly, it's going to take place under the rule of Jesus Christ uh, in his kingdom. Verse 37 of Matthew 10 continues. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Is Christ divisive? In a world bent on wickedness, Christ is absolutely divisive. In a world that is prone to sin and is prone to rebellion against God, yes, Christ is absolutely divisive. Christ desires peace and unity, but not peace and unity at the expense of truth, but truth at the expense of peace and unity if necessary. So Jesus says, hey, you come to him, you confess him as Lord. This is a life-changing decision. And you know what the evidence that salvation is a life-changing decision? Right here. It says you come to Christ and receive him as your Lord and Savior. And guess what? Your father may turn on you. Your mother may turn on you. Your sons or your daughters, your daughters-in-law may turn on you because of your faith, your profession in Jesus Christ. What a far cry from this idea uh, that you can simply pray a, a quick prayer and seal up eternity in heaven and never think again of Christ. Christ lays out salvation this way. When you commit your life to me, it is so life-changing, it turns your life so upside down that you're going to lose relationships. Uh, fathers are going to separate from their children and daughters uh, are going to separate from their mothers and so on. Families, the closest of relationships can be divided because of Christ. He says, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. He came to bring division. It's repeated in Luke 14, verse 25. And there went great multitudes with them, and he turned and said unto them, and I've come back to this passage, and I told you that this is so interesting to me. Whenever there's a multitude, is Christ, it, was he, did he come just to gather multitudes? No, that's not why he came, right? He's looking for those who would worship God in spirit and truth. That was his priority, spirit and truth. So here's a multitude. He turns to the multitude, and he wants to thin the crowd. He's saying, I've got this multitude following me, but within this multitude, there's many who are here for the wrong reasons. So I'm going to thin the crowd. Verse 26. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, tough passage, very tough passage. You telling me uh, if I'm going to follow Christ, I have to hate my mom. If I am going to follow Christ, I have to hate my father and my wife. What is he trying to say here? What he's trying to say is that if Christ is not the supreme relationship in your life, you will not continue as his disciple. If you don't set out in your mind that he is number one, above all else, Christ is supreme in my life. You see, when you have Christ as supreme in your life, he dictates every other relationship that you have. If you have one relationship in your life that is supreme to your relationship with Christ, then you cannot be his disciple. That relationship somewhere down the road is going to draw you away from Christ and your priorities are off and you will not continue as his disciple. This is what he's saying. So every other relationship is inferior to my relationship with Jesus Christ. If that is the case, remember we're talking about persecution. If that is the case, then what happens when dad starts to persecute me for my faith? What happens when my children begin to persecute me for my faith? What happens when these other relationships break down? If you have your priorities right and you realize Christ is supreme in all of my relationships, you're going to say, that's okay. It's all right. Christ is supreme. He's the number one relationship. All other relationships are expendable if these are being divided because of my faith in Jesus Christ. You've got to have that priority right. If you don't have the priority right, persecution is going to harm your faith. The fact is, Christ will cost you relationships. 
Christ will cost you relationships. He laid it out, and he said, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. There will be those. Uh, you think about, uh, oftentimes in the church, talk about separation, eh? You know, you separate from this crowd and separate from that crowd. But you know, there are some that you don't need to separate from because they're going to separate from you, right? That's what it says here in our passage in verse 22. Blessed are you when men shall hate you and when they shall separate you from their company. It literally simply means they exclude you. They push you out, right? You've probably experienced that. Just by the change and you being vocal about your faith and your life changing uh, as you become more like Christ, many people just push you out, right? So your relationships are lost or others don't hang out with you as much uh, because there's evidence of your faith which they are recoiling against, so they exclude you. They push you out. That happens. Don't think th something is wrong. What am I doing wrong? Well, as we're going to see in a moment, you could be doing something wrong. We'll get to that in a second. But don't think, hey, you know, maybe, my, maybe I'm not living my faith out properly because others are separating from me or, or excluding me. Hey, Jesus said it was going to happen. That's what a faith, an uncompromised faith in Christ leads to. Be confident of that. There will be those who will separate from us, but then there are those situations where we must separate from others. 1 Peter 4.1, he says, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh... Arm yourselves likewise in the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. He's saying it was enough in our past life to have lived like that, when we walked in lasciviousness and lust and excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, abominable idolatries. We'll explain those a little bit later. Wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. He's saying, you live this life, your unsaved life, lasciviousness, it's, uh, extreme sensuality, lust, and excess of wine, revelings, and, and so on. And banquetings actually has the idea, or revelings actually has the idea of sexual sin. But uh, this was our life before. And he says, now when you stop those things, it says, they then turn and look at you and think you're strange. Now, I'm going to come back to this passage a little bit. You stop living that lifestyle. You separate. You start going to church. You start reading your Bible. You start praying. You, you start uh, wanting to live for Jesus Christ. And they look at you, even in the midst of that absolute uh, debased lifestyle, and they look at you and say, wow, you're strange. And then they speak evil of you, right? It says that they think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of right, right? You've stopped. You have separated. See, there are those who exclude you, but then there's some instances where you say, I'm not going to do that anymore. And you know what's going to happen? People are going to think you're strange. So the invitation uh, to go out to drink or, or party or, or whatever that you used to say, oh, yeah, I'm coming. Say, no, nah, you know what? I've, I've stopped that. Uh, that's not for me anymore. You separate and they turn and they think you're strange. Persecution. And that says what? Speak evil of you. Unbelievers will tolerate almost any lifestyle, but not that of a genuine believer in Christ. They say, you know what? Lasciviousness, okay. Lusts, all right. Excess of wine, okay. Revelings, okay. Uh, abominable idolatries, okay. Christ, you're strange. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 tells us, well, I'll read it, verse 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? They don't go together, do they? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, based upon all this, the fact that our bodies are his temple, that he's in us, that he dwells in us, and he walks in us, and he's our God, and we're his people. Because of all that, come out from among them, be separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. That's separation. He says, hey, because of your relationship with God, because you've been made new on the inside, the Spirit's inside of you, hey, he says, be separate. Come out from among them. Don't touch that. There are times, because of your faith, men will separate from you, exclude you, speak evil of you. 
There's other times because of your faith that we need to make the decision and say, I am separated, right? That's natural. This is what Christ said should happen and will happen. If we don't have that perspective, you know what's going to happen? If we don't believe Christ is supreme over all of our relationships, then the threat of losing relationships is going to harm our faith. It's going to cause us to turn from Christ in an instant if we believe that those relationships that we have put above Christ, if we believe those are going to be lost, then we're going to compromise our faith. Matthew 12, uh, 13, 20, it's the parable of the sower. Remember the, the, the seed in the stony places? Matthew 13, 20, But he that received the seed in the stony places, the same as he that hears the word, and anon, right away, immediately, receives it with joy. Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he is offended. That is, hey, I'm continuing, but because I have not given myself to Christ and because I have all these other things that are greater than Christ in my life, as soon as persecution comes, by and by, again, immediately, he receives, receives the word immediately with joy. But then when persecution comes, immediately, he is offended. You've got to have the right perspective or persecution is going to drive you away from Christ. Next of all, not only is Christ our supreme relationship, but heavenly rewards are far greater than earthly acceptance. Heavenly rewards are far greater than earthly acceptance. Look in verse 23 of Luke 6. He says, Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. How can you handle persecution? So somebody uh, offends you or somebody separates from you or somebody's speaking evil of you. He says, Rejoice. Hey, be happy. Why? Because if you have the right perspective, you realize acceptance in this world isn't that big of a deal. If you have the right perspective, you realize that the heavenly rewards are far greater. So you can handle the persecution here, and you can handle the separation, and you can handle the rejection here because you realize this is not all that I'm about. I'm here, and I'm passing through, and in Hebrews 11, I'm just this pilgrim, right? But I'm looking for a country. I'm looking for a heavenly city, and that's where your rewards are. So he says, uh, rejoice, leap for joy. Your reward is great in heaven. Remember in Acts chapter 5, the apostles are beaten for preaching Christ. They are beaten for preaching Christ. And the Bible says in Acts 5.41, they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing. Why? That they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Rejoicing. Why? Because in their mind, they didn't think, if I just get along with everybody, if everybody uh, likes me and accepts me, uh, then I'm going to have a successful life. That was not their perspective. Their perspective was, hey, uh, being beaten here, being persecuted here is okay because I've identified with Jesus Christ and I was worthy to suffer shame for his name. Having the right perspective makes a world of difference when it comes to persecution. 1 Peter 4, 12. He says, Beloved, think it not strange, don't think this strange, concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice. And as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their party is evil spoken of, but on your party is glorified. Now remember last week we talked about delayed gratification. Delayed gratification. Because in this passage he says, if you weep now, you will laugh then. And he says, if you hunger now, you will be filled then. And he's talking about uh, that, the fact that we live our lives with that idea, that this life is not all that there is, and that when I get there, then I will be satisfied, then I will be uh, filled, and so on. Delayed gratification. Well, you see it in this passage as well, in 1 Peter 4. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. He says, Handle the persecution now. Handle the trials now because future, then when his glory is revealed, then you'll be glad. Then you'll have exceeding joy. Now, I said, hey, people separate from you. Speak evil of you. Don't think, don't, don't think that's strange. Jesus said it's going to happen, okay? But there's a qualifier here. And you see that in 1 Peter 4, verse 15. It says, but let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other, busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. You see, 
There are some Christians, those who name the name of Christ, who suffer, but they're not suffering for the faith. Now here it says a murderer and a thief, and now he goes from the extreme murderer to busybody, right? That's, that's quite a spectrum there. The point is that Christians can suffer for all sorts of reasons, but there are some Christians who are claiming persecution when really they're simply disliked because they're obnoxious, they're arrogant, self-righteous, condemning, judgmental. There are Christians who go about this life and, and uh, they just condemn everybody and everything they see. They have an air of self-righteousness and an air of arrogance. And as a result, people recoil at that and they respond to it with rejection. And then this Christian says, ah, I'm being persecuted, right? Listen, the Bible says, let no man suffer as, and then this broad spectrum of sin. Don't claim persecution every time you get a negative feeling from somebody, okay? The context here is suffering for the name of Christ, suffering on his behalf. It says, your reward is great in heaven. What rewards are we going to get in heaven? Well, you know, some people look at uh, heavens, the streets of gold, and things like that. And um, so when we get to heaven, what? He's going to give us a treasure box. You know, the classic idea of a mansion. Listen, you're not going to have a mansion in heaven. Get it out of your head. You're going to be disappointed. You're not going to be disappointed. <laughs> you're going to get something better than a mansion. But you're not going to have a mansion in heaven, all right? Mansion simply means a place. He says, in my father's house, we're going to be in his house, not in our own house. Many places in the father's house. The word mansion is an old King James word. It simply means place. There's this idea that, okay, if you're faithful in this world, then you're sending ahead materials for Christ to build your mansion. <laughs> That's foolish. He's prepared a place by his death on the cross. He's prepared a place by redemption. And now we can all enter into the father's house. The idea of laying treasures in heaven means that when we face Jesus Christ at the judgment, he is going to look at those who have been faithful to him and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So when Christ looks at you and says, well done, thou good and faithful servant, are you going to look back and say, okay, but where's my gold? I've been working all this time for, for a crown of gold. Some other riches in heaven. That's, that's what I've been doing this for, not the commendation of my Lord. That's not what's going to happen. Laying up treasures in heaven looks to the commendation of Christ, saying that when I stand before him at the judgment, I want his commendation. I don't want. Listen, there's other religions of the world who play those games. Hey, if you deprive your flesh now, when you get to heaven, you can have virgins. That's not Christianity. When I get to heaven, I'm looking to stand before Jesus Christ and have his commendation because I have been faithful to him. Matthew 6, 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Saying, hey, don't focus on this world. Focus on that world is basically what he's saying. Live for that world. Live so that we can rejoice when he appears those rewards are far greater moses hebrews 11 24 says by faith moses when he was come to years refused to be called the son of pharaoh's daughter he could add great riches he could add great prominence to be called pharaoh's daughter but he refused why choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of god than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season esteeming the reproach of christ greater riches than the treasures in egypt for he had respect on the recompense of the reward he says i'm looking forward and he had the right perspective so he said no not sin for a season he says i am looking forward and there's going to be greater treasures and riches uh, if i stay faithful to christ the greatest reward will be when christ in matthew 25 looks and he says well done thou good and faithful servant and that's a parable there but he's showing us that faithfulness to him results in his commendation also, one of the benefits of persecution is that your faith will be strengthened. One of the benefits of persecution is that you're going to have an opportunity to learn to rest and rely upon God. Another benefit of persecution is that it strengthens you in your relationship with Jesus Christ as these other relationships are broken. Another benefit of persecution is you become an example to others, as Hebrews 11 shows us. We are to have the right priorities. Christ is our supreme relationship. Heavenly rewards are far greater than, than earthly acceptance. And next, number two, there are only two. 
not only must we have the right priorities, but we ought to have the right perspective. The fact is that godly men have always, always faced persecution. Verse 23, Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. You know what company you are associated with when you face persecution from others? The prophets. Identification with godly men who have gone on before. Godly men have always faced persecution. So persecution oftentimes is not a sign that you're doing something wrong, but that you're doing something right. 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And it says this, Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. He's saying, resist the devil. Resist him. What's going to help you to resist the devil and his temptation? Knowing that your brethren in the world are facing the very same temptations. That is encouraging, isn't it? To know that other Christians are struggling and other Christians are being victorious in their faith over temptation. That's very encouraging. So he says, keep an eye on others and see that they are facing the same things. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. It's a, it's a establishing, it's a purifying, it's a settling effect that persecution has on those who, uh, whose faith is tried and then their, their faith rears up under that persecution. That's the whole point of Hebrews 11. The passage calls these the great cloud of witnesses, right? That have gone on before us. Hebrews 11, verse 32 he says, what, what uh, shall I say more? Shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and, and Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah and David also and Samuel and of the prophets. He says, who through faith subdued kingdoms? You say, well, that's great. They subdued kingdoms, okay. Wrought righteousness, abstained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. You say, wow, that's fantastic. They stopped the mouths of lions. Quenched the violence of fire. Well, they overcame the violence of fire, but guess what? They were exposed to the violence of fire. Escaped the edge of the sword. They escaped the edge of the sword, not escaped having to experience men coming at you with a sword. But they escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the enemies. And all of this is persecution, and there's the violence of fire, and there's the edge of the sword, and there's uh, wars, there's battles. They were victorious in them, but they still had to face those things. Women received their dead raised to life again. Well, that's a list of victories, right? Continues. Others were tortured. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. Now, there's no deliverance here. Yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. They were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. He's saying that these, the persecution they faced, yes, many were delivered out of these things, but many were not delivered. And even those who suffered and were killed, tortured, even these are commended in this passage as not compromising their faith. Now, this is persecution, right? This is persecution here in Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 is there so we can look at it and say, look what these men went through. Look what they went through. And that ought to give us some boldness to face the persecution that comes to us. We identify with them. But the greatest identification that persecution brings to us is not identifying with godly men who have gone on before, though that's very important. The greatest identify, uh, identification is our identification with Christ when we suffer. John 15, 18. It says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Well, that's encouraging. The world hates me, Jesus. That's okay. It hated me first. The world hates me. You say, that's all right. Guess what? You're living like I lived. They are responding to you the way they responded to me. And you identify with Christ through persecution. He says, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. Hey, they don't like you because you're not like them. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So remember the, uh, the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. You know, it's a shame is that you have 
pastors and preachers and ministries that have this mentality that if we simply change the message a little bit, the world's going to accept us. And they have this approach to ministry. Uh, they get on CNN or talk to Larry King or whatever, and they get asked hard questions, and they don't give biblical answers. Why? Because they're, they're not fishing for truth. They're fishing for harmony. Uh, but Jesus says, hey, you're not going to be greater than me. I came and spoke the truth and was crucified. If you go into the world and speak the truth, you also will be persecuted. But you have pastors and preachers who think that they're just going to do something differently than Christ did. And they're not going to be so bold, and they're not going to be so confrontational, and then there'll be harmony in life. Jesus says, no, servant's not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they also will persecute you. Verse 21, but all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin, but now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. Persecution causes you and enables you to identify with Christ. John 15, 18, again, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. First John 3, 1 says this, Behold the manner of love, uh, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Not a strange thing. They hated Christ. They hate those who represent Christ as well. All right, lastly. You've got to have the right perspective. Number one, that godly men have always suffered persecution. And number two, that the world only accepts the world will only accept you on its terms. The world will only accept you on its terms, and its terms are always ungodly. The world will only accept you on its terms, and its terms are always ungodly. Luke 6, 26. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. What? Again, Christ comes with his idea completely contrary to what we would say. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Those are the ones that the world accepts. The false prophets, not the true prophets, the false prophets. Again, Jesus said in John 15, 18, the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you're of the world, then the world would love his own. If the world is loving you, and if your friends who are living in sin are loving you and accepting you, it may be that there's something wrong with your life, right? Right? The world only accepts on its terms, and its terms are always ungodly. 1 John 2.16 says, All that is in the world, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, not of the Father, but of the world. That's what's in the world, and we are different, right? And the world will only accept, those on those, accept us on those terms. 1 John 4 says, 1 John 4, 4 says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. It says, they are of the world. Therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. He's saying, if you speak what the world wants to hear, they're going to receive you. But if you speak of the things of God, they're going to reject you. Hey, this, is just a, this is just a biblical truth regarding Christianity. If the world's going to accept you, they're going to accept you on their terms and their terms only, and you're going to have to speak those things which please them, not those things which please Christ. Now, I'm going to give you a little qualifier here. You still speak the truth of God, and you still desire, and you still pray for the world to accept the gospel that you're preaching. You still preach the gospel to the world, and you still expect them to receive it, because that's how God operates. He blesses the preaching of his word by his Holy Spirit, and he works in the hearts of ungodly people and he draws them to himself for salvation so we still preach the word to the world and we pray for them that they would be saved that god would bless and he would draw these people to himself so what does the world accept you want to be accepted by the world what does it accept back to first peter chapter four remember it says that we should no longer live the rest of our time in the flesh to the lusts of the men but to the will of god for in times past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, you can call that sensuality, lusts or passions, excess of wine or drunkenness. The word revelings actually has the idea of a, of an, a sexual deviant sinfulness. Banquetings or even drinking parties, that's the idea there, or idolatry. This is what we used to be. And again, then the world looks at Christians and says, but you're strange. So they accept this lewd lifestyle of, of uh, the basest of sin, but rejects Christ. 
Is that who you want to be accepted by? Well, this world has some tools. This world has some tools in their hatred towards Christians. Have you ever heard Christians called divisive? You ever heard uh, uh, Christianity in general called a divisive religion? Have you ever heard a Christian called intolerant? Are there intolerant Christians? Yeah, there are. But uh, the way the world uses the word is a little bit different. Have you ever heard Christians labeled as speaking uh, hate speech? You know, ever since Barack Obama came out and said that he, uh, he was in favor of gay marriage, it's really ramped up the debate in the United States. And uh, you have seen, you've got to listen for this word. They'll speak of a certain politician or something. Well, he supports a, uh, a hate group. Then you look and see what the hate group is, and it's some organization that supports the traditional definition of marriage. And now they're labeling these things hate groups or hate speech. This is the way the world operates. I don't usually do this, but uh, I, I'm going to do it today. I don't usually read right off the paper things that I've written, but I'm going to do that today. What I want you to do is I want you to think about how the world operates. And I want you to, the reason I'm doing this is because I want you to look at who it is that you desire to be accepted by. Okay? If you have this drive to be accepted by the world and not to face persecution, you've got to understand who the world is in general. I mean, Satan is the prince of the power of the air and the god of this world, and there, there's some uh, nice people in the world, but frankly, it's a, it's a societal system that's ruled by Satan and his influences. I want you to think about who it is that you want to be accepted by. The priority of this world is to freely indulge in the basis of fleshly, even animalistic desires and impulses. That's the, the desire. And you see it more and more in our society uh, now. They see God, Christ, and the Bible, and Christians as those who would deprive them of that right. And so they respond with absolute rejection. They look at you and I and the Bible and the idea of God ruling and reigning as that which would deprive them of the right to simply satisfy their flesh. They understand God as a moral lawgiver, but they will not be governed by any moral code outside of that which they have come up with themselves. They rage against the concept of God's authority because to them there is no authority outside of their own desires. Nobody's going to put authority over me. I am my own authority. As much as man would reject God and his moral law in favor of liberty or libertinism, the idea of just do whatever I want when I want. There's one thing they can't escape. Even though they want to come out from under his authority, there's one thing they can't escape. They can't remove God's moral law from their heart. The Bible teaches us that all men are born with God's moral law in their heart, so there is at least a testimony in their conscience telling them there is a God. Even those in the depths of sin have a sense of sinfulness. You know that? Even those in the depths of sin have a sense of their own sinfulness, knowing that what they're doing is sinful. In fact, this innate awareness of what is sinful and what is not is often what drives God's rejectors even further into sin as an affront to God and to show an open and absolute rebellion against him. They continue in all that they know God abhors. Paul told us that. He said he didn't know sin until the law, and then once the law showed him it was sin, then sin revived, right? Uh, there are many who operate in the basis of lifestyles, uh, taking part in this sinfulness, knowing it's sin and rebellion against God, and continuing in it, out of rebellion against him. One may think that a society in which all men are able to do whatever they want, hey, just leave me alone. You don't, don't judge me, I won't judge you. You don't try to control me, I won't, well, I won't try to control you. Uh, that, that seems great. We could just practice Christianity and they can do whatever they want to do. They don't bother us, we don't bother them. That seems like an ideal arrangement, but it's not. There's a problem with that. God governs the universe. Whether we recognize him or not, he governs the universe, and his moral law, rooted in his very character, is unchanging. Even if society silences those who would preach the gospel and vilify those who expose sinfulness, they cannot accept the universal, they cannot escape the universal law of God that's written in their hearts. So even those who are continuing a life of sinfulness have God's testimony in their conscience, uh, testifying to them that he exists, and even drawing them to seek out God. Their consciences continually betray their claims of freedom from God's moral law. Now, this is where persecution comes in. The fact that man ultimately cannot escape the truth of God's universal rule is often what leads to the brutal persecution of his people. Sinners begin by attempting to silence the voices of opposition, and that's what we see today. They claim they only desire tolerance of the sin. 
That's the key word, right? Just be tolerant. We're just looking for tolerance. Hey, it doesn't stay at tolerance very long, right? They claim they only desire tolerance of their sin, yet toleration does not soothe their conscience. And that's the key. Once society begins to tolerate that sinfulness, then they realize, you know what? That hasn't done it for me. I still feel as if uh, I am being condemned. It does not soothe their conscience. So demands for tolerance then escalate to demands for acceptance. See, tolerance simply says, you leave me alone. You tolerate my existence. You tolerate my actions. Now, you don't have to take part in it. You don't have to accept it. You don't have to endorse it. You just tolerate it. That doesn't last very long. The conscience is not soothed in these uh, men and women. So tolerance then morphs into a demand for acceptance. Well, now you're really treading on man's belief systems. Because you say, not only do you tolerate the fact I exist, but you need to confess that you accept me. Once their sinfulness is largely accepted by society, their conscience still bears witness against them. Say, well, that didn't do it either. Uh, I still have this sense of condemnation in my heart. Even though we have gotten tolerance and we have gotten acceptance by society, I still feel as if I am being condemned. Their conscience is bearing witness against them. But they take that inward testimony against their sin and they lash outwardly at those that they believe represent God's moral law. They then move from demands that others passively accept their sin to demanding that all actively embrace and even promote their sin. And then their sinfulness comes into the uh, media and their sinfulness comes into school curriculum and their sinfulness then comes from tolerance to acceptance now to endorsing. That's the progression. Why? Because man cannot escape God's testimony in their heart against their own sinfulness. And they rage and they lash outwardly because of the inward testimony of their own sinfulness. Their mission for acceptance and tolerance and promotion are simply futile attempts at soothing their own consciences. Yet their conscience is not soothed. It betrays them. It reminds them that there is a moral law higher than their own desires. And with the moral law comes a moral law giver. Their conscience exposes their sinfulness as more than simply an exercise of freedom. It reveals it for what it is, which is open rebellion against a moral God. Listen, this is what's happening in the heart and in the life of this world. This is why persecution boils to the surface often. Sinners are unable to escape the reality that is God's ruling moral code and so lash out at all that they see as representing his authority. Soon the very existence of those who hold to God's moral code become unacceptable. Throughout history, this escalation of sinfulness in a society has repeatedly led to the rejection, persecution, and even execution of God's people. You see it throughout history. As a society becomes uh, deeper and deeper within its sinfulness, persecution rises against God's people. So, calls for the, to uh, calls for the tolerance of sin ultimately lead to an intolerance of God's people. Calls for acceptance of sin turns to rejection of Christians. The, de the demand that sin be embraced is accompanied with demands that God be hated. The ultimate goal of sinners then is not tolerance and acceptance, but freedom from God. That's key. The ultimate goal of sinners is not tolerance and acceptance, but freedom from God, which is something they will never attain. Until they realize this, all that is godly will be targets of their sin-soaked hatefulness. Listen. This is the world. As much as you look, you've got friends that are in the world, you've got co-workers, you've got acquaintances in the world, nice people. But in the depths of the hearts of those who have not received Christ as their Lord and Savior, the Bible says, hey, they're at enmity against God. This is what's happening. They're rebelling against his authority. And as long as they're rebelling against the authority of God, they're going to rebel against all that represents his authority. And that's where you and I fall in, and that's the root of persecution. Is that who you want to be accepted by? I'm not trying to demonize those in the world. We are to love the world as far as the people in it. We are to pray for their salvation. We are to share the gospel with them. And we are even to befriend them for the purpose of sharing the gospel. But we still need to understand what is at work in the heart of those who are unsaved and what was at work in our hearts before we were saved. Well, Jesus says, we're almost done here, okay? Jesus says to rejoice. He says uh, that we identify with who? With the prophets who have gone on before, in verse 26. Um, 
and verse 23. For in like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. And then verse 26 says, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. You see, the Jewish nation of the Old Testament, the ungodly Jewish nation of the Old Testament, is very similar to the world as we see it today. In Isaiah 30, verse 8, it says, Now go, write it before them in a table, and note it in a book, that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. That this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, that's like to the prophets, right? See not, and to the prophets prophesy not unto us right things. Speak unto us smooth things and prophesy deceits. This is what the world is saying. This is what the Jews were saying. Uh, don't talk to us about the law of God. Speak smooth things. Prophesy deceits to us. Get ye out of the way. Turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. We don't want him. But you can stay prophets, right? And this is what you see in the world. So you have churches. Churches can explode in a nation as a respect and a fear of God decreases. Churches can still increase, right? And this is what they're saying. Uh, the prophets are okay. The seers are okay. But we're just going to change their message. This is the type of prophets that the world admires. Jeremiah 5.31 it says, the prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means, and my people love to have it so. And what will you do in the end thereof? He's saying, hey, this is what the, the false prophets and my people love it. They soak it up. Micah 2.11 says, if a man walking in the spirit and falsehood do lie, saying, I will prophesy unto thee of wine and of strong drink, he shall even be the prophet of this people. So a prophet comes and he's, he's lying and he's, hey, let's talk about what? The base things of the world. And this is what he wants to bring before his people. He says, that prophet is the one that my people are going to accept and embrace. Yeah. Sinfulness can increase. Persecution towards uh, genuine Christians can increase. Or, and also the church can increase in its attendance. How? You can just change the type of preacher and the message that's in those places, right? Well, last passage and we're done. Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4.2, he says, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They're saying, hey, uh, you know, tickle our ears just to make us feel good about ourselves. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Hey, don't think it's odd. Don't think it's strange that the world is continuing on this path of sinfulness. The pattern of history is such that a society, uh, even if it starts with some semblance of godliness, will continue and deteriorate to the point then where uh, it is the furthest from God that it can be, and God executes judgment upon it. That's a pattern throughout history, and I think we are witnessing that in the West, not to say that God cannot turn it around, but don't think it's strange when you're persecuted. Don't think it's strange when relationships are lost. Don't think it's strange when the world does not accept you. This is the nature of being a follower of Jesus Christ. You are his servant and you will not be greater than him. And he came and he suffered because of who he was. And uh, we also will if we are faithful to him. So how do you handle persecution? Got to have the right priorities. Christ is supreme over all other relationships. Heavenly rewards are far greater than earthly acceptance. You got to have the right perspective. Think about it. Godly men have always experienced persecution. It's not strange. And the world only accepts on its terms, and its terms are always ungodly. Well, let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray for those who may be here. How this deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure. That he should give his only son To make a wretch his treasure